It is Brian White Day. Brian White, how are you doing? You're still down in Mexico, and I understand you are just learning almost nothing. You know, it's on the lower end of the spectrum of what I had hoped to learn. I learned some things that I didn't didn't expect to, to find out, but I've uh, haven't been able to connect with as many people on the ground as I had hoped, but it's still a productive trip. And uh, when we're done today recording, I will be grabbing my stuff and getting out of here and heading to the airport. So why are you keeping me, Randy? Why? I know I'm just keeping you, I'm keeping you because everybody <laughs> demands that you show up on Monday on this channel and maybe Tuesday too, even after they watch you on Monday, but that's good that we get some activity. So uh, we're going to talk about a couple of things. Um, <laughs> I tell you, man, I knew your viewers must be crazy, but I had no idea. Yeah, you know, they watch these shirts, man. So, you know, that's they what they're here for. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what they're here for, the shirts. So, all right, uh, Brian, uh, I'm, I want to get around to Tesla's unbelievable production rate and the impact of that in a second. <laughs> but before we get to that craziness and think it's something that nobody's paying any attention to, let's talk for just a second about something you just said to me, which is why uh, electric cars, BEVs, are not really doing that great in Mexico. Um, and I thought that was very interesting and might have a lot of implications for Chile or other South American countries, Central America, et cetera. What, what did you find? So I did a bunch of research on it. I read a bunch of articles and then I went out and talked to people, real people on the street, um, people in the industry and asked why is EV adoption so low in Mexico? And the answers I got were, um, the first being, um, a lack of home charging. Not a lot of people have a garage or carport or building they can park right next to to home charge at all. So a, lot of, uh, a lot of apartment dwellers and condo dwellers and things of that nature. The place I'm staying in is brand new. It's less than two years old. It's a high rise and it's got a fantastic secure parking garage, no charging. Um, and if people of this level of means can't charge at home, it's difficult. Um, and then even if you do have a home, you have to still pay for your level two charger, which can be a burdensome cost. Next one is that there's no EV incentives of any kind. If you can charge at home, it is cheaper for sure than buying gas. Sure. But if you can't charge at home, you're stuck going to a public charger, which erases all the savings. Right. Um, with Tesla, less so. With Tesla, it would still be a little bit cheaper, but um, not a whole lot cheaper. And there are very few public chargers. In Monterey, there's about 27, if you include all of the you know 10 kilowatt chargers at hotels yeah. um, when you're talking fast chargers like proper fast chargers there's more like four wow. for a city of millions that is inadequate oh, uh, <clears throat> to to fuel a revolution and then you've got some other things like um the fact that they've only been for sale here really for a few years means every car ever sold is still under warranty there oh. are no shops to fix them Okay. Where are you going to find a shop to fix cars when there are none broken outside of warranty? So that's a big question mark for resale. And then, of course, you've got things like the uh, high interest rates being persistent. That slows it down. And a big one is it's hard to impulse buy an electric car here. There are no inventory cars in in Mexico. There are demo cars, there are show cars, but those very rarely come up for sale. And if you wish to buy one, it is shipped not from Giga Texas, a, a mere days, half days drive away, but from Shanghai. So it makes it, you have to really want one and then really be in a lucky situation where it actually makes sense for you. And that's just holding back adoption overall. There is also, I didn't mention this before, there hasn't been a standardized charger plug yet. Oh. So you've got CCS, you've got NACS, and you've got the Chinese charger. That's ridiculous. You're yeah. holding it back. And then you also mentioned that uh, you can buy a decent car for a lot, for a whole lot less money, money. Yeah. a whole lot less money. You can get a BYD hybrid pickup truck for 35,000 with a crew cab. It's uh, how do you compete with that? It's yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I just thought that was interesting. I think it has, you know, implications for beyond Mexico um, and, uh, you know, lots of other countries around the world where, you know, BYD adoption right now is almost zero, um, uh, you know, as we go up 
further and further up that S curve, it's going to be probably a little harder and harder to actually uh, break into some of these markets because the, uh, the, and, you know, people talk about the Midwest also uh, not adopting as fast in the United States. We got to remember that uh, on the coasts, I know in California, for instance, you know, it's not unusual to have gasoline at around five bucks a gallon. You go inland and it's, you know, three bucks or 295 or whatever. That's a big difference. That's a huge motivator for West Coast folks uh, to get into an EV. Uh, yes. And I saw a fun post the other day from Dirty Tesla where he's like, these, I, he had to buy gas for something. He goes, these prices are outrageous. And it was like three low threes a gallon. I was like, is, are you messing with me, bro? I think you're messing with me, but. All right. Well, the main thing I wanted to talk to you about today, because theoretically you are the guy. <laughs> I love it. So, so we had reporting just last week that in in Shanghai, they have got the throughput rate down to 30 seconds from 42. Um, I Somebody said that they had dropped it from 42 to 35 and that we already knew that. I don't remember that information. If it crossed my desk, I didn't, I don't remember. But in any case, from 42 to 30, uh, we know that two years ago it was at 42 and they were doing almost a million vehicles. So at 30 seconds, that sounds to me like they can do like 1.35, 1.4 million vehicles out of that space. So what we're looking at, uh, I also didn't hear about the 42 seconds to 35, nor the nor to 30, but we're not following it that closely because those are, you know, peak rates. Those don't always translate to a full production year. Uh, they can't, it's just not how it works, but, uh, the, the question is, wait, why? Why are they doing this? Is it because demand is strong? Because demand is strong. I know people in Southeast Asia who are reporting um, four to six weeks for delivery, six to eight weeks for delivery. So there is still a backlog in Southeast Asia. But even with that, and even with cars going increasingly to Mexico and presumably South America, even with new markets opening and uh, and open markets maturing, why, Randy? Why would they be bursting at full speed if sales are, you know, lagging? Well, I think part of it is just that uh, it costs less. And it cr creates more space. They said they also picked up 100 yards of space. I don't know what the other dimension was, but 100 yards ain't nothing in a factory. Um, and uh, there was, uh, you know, so you, you save money, uh, you pick up some space, apparently. Um, and also just just because sales might be soft now doesn't mean sales will be soft a year from now. And you want to also be able to produce this 3.5 vehicle, two, sorry, 2.5 vehicle on that same line, which theoretically will have really big sales. So I don't know, those would be a few reasons I had in mind. What do you think? Well, it almost feels like they might be stockpiling cars as if they're going to shut down a line for some reason. Some reason. Hmm. Could it be the Juniper refresh? Now we saw, let's look at the Model 3 fresh uh, timeline. We saw a test car in the US. Well, we've seen that now, it's out on the road. And then shortly thereafter, three to three to four months later, um, boom, it's out in China. Right. And, and well, a stockpile, what good is that? You gotta get rid of all the old cars. What they did in China was they switched over one model and right. said, if you want, if you want the new hotness, it's this variant. It's only this variant. The others will come later. So that could very well be what they're doing is stockpiling. Mm -hmm. If they don't do the changeover before the end of quarter, we will know if that stockpile is real because we will see a unsold days of inventory increase. Now, if unsold days of inventory increases, that's not a big deal because they're already at historic lows. They've already uh, oversold from last quarter. So if it goes back up, no problem. But I think you're right that the faster they go, the cheaper they are to build. And that means they could offer even, even a few more small discounts, whether that's a free color, whether that's a, a, a you know, free wheel upgrade or something else, or just money, 
uh, or more aggressive financing, whatever it may be, it gives them a demand lever to pull. So their fixed costs remain about the same. They, that's why they're called fixed. And that means their marginal cost can decrease a little bit. Yeah. And I think it was, it might've been Jeff said the other day that if you in fact now do have uh, 300,000 additional capacity, and again, it might be that it would be just sucked up immediately by Juniper or by 2.5 um, or just by demand. But he was saying, if you have added that 300,000 capacity, what you want to do now is you want to use it. You, you want to, you want to absolutely, if you want, have to lower the price, lower the price because you'll pick it up in the volume that uh, that is now over a, a uh, your your overhead is now uh, less per car, your capital investment is less per car, et cetera. So you're actually making the same, maybe the same profit, even though you give us a, a lower price. Absolutely all true things. I would say that the Juniper refresh is imminent. There yes. is nothing but evidence to support that. I would say that the 2.5 uh, model, the compact intermediate, the temporary holdover. We haven't seen it. That tells me it's more than three to six months out. Oh yeah. I would, I would agree with that. So now my other question becomes, all right, let's say that we now have an additional capacity in, uh, in uh, Shanghai. Uh, but if we have this three, 30 second th uh, throughput rate in Shanghai, are we able to apply what we've learned in Shanghai to Berlin, to Austin, maybe even Fremont? So Fremont, throw it out. Throw it's, it out. <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's an old, old line. They've done a very good job at optimizing it. But the copy-paste pattern system that they're using elsewhere, I don't see how you could get the full benefit from it. It's a great factory. It's been, you know, much love to Fremont but I don't see it being the thing that that's able to catch up in Berlin. We've seen them do that. We've seen them say, okay, we've got some new lessons here. We're going to take the factory down for three days or six days and reconfigure to add these new lessons from Shanghai that will improve throughput. You remember famously Herbert Dies got to tour Giga Berlin and he said, okay guys, so I've got a problem here. Um, they're making a car in what, three hours, and we're making a car in like eight hours yeah. or 20 hours. Right. I mean, some something ridiculously yeah. horrible. And then a week later, Berlin shuts down for a week to retool to improve throughput. And you know, Volkswagen <laughs> had to just be a little frustrated, I think is, is a polite way of putting it. Uh, so <clears throat> it'll, it remains to be seen what, uh, what will happen. But I think, uh, yeah, all Fremont, and Texas can improve their throughput. And Texas still has additional capacity. I had right. heard a, a rumor that some of the Cybertruck was being built on a Model Y line while they were completing the Cybertruck line. Um, and that once complete would free up. Uh, and that was one reason listed for the drastic reduction in output of Model Ys from Texas. Huh. Once that line, if if true, once that line is running again, uh, they would have, uh, yeah, more capacity for Ys. But what they need to do, because they're already pulling all the demand levers. We've got the low interest. We've got the free color. We've got the FSD transfer. We've got the low, you know, I mean, it's, it's all there. What they would need to move more is realistically, I guess, lower price. And I don't know how much movement that would create, but potentially some. Well, I'm going to break news with you. Let's do I it. Oh my gosh. I don't gosh. normally break news with you because this is on the financial side and I don't know why I usually, you know, throw these things at Larry first, but I'm going to throw it at you first. Do you think that the IRA has actually been one of the reasons U.S. sales have slowed of the, e of, of the BEV, of the, of the actual Model 3s and Model Ys? because the hybrid got mm. such a nice bump and that lowered the price of a hybrid to crazy low prices and caused General Motors and Ford to both go, forget EVs, we're going to do hybrids. I think there is absolutely merit in that argument. I think the hybrid credit is bonkers. It is absolutely bonkers. There is no 
good. So you're telling me you're going to put basically a couple of D batteries in this gas car. And now it's, and now it gets more credit than some EVs. Yeah. Then I'd say most models on the market get little or no credit. And this, this dyno burner without a plug, uh, gets a credit. That's yeah. But the, the problem with the IRA is like anything in politics, you have to compromise. You have to include enough uh, parties in it that it will, that it gets the broad support it needs. And if that had been not included at all, it may not have passed. Yes. Yeah. What I would have liked to have seen is a more scientific approach to the credit where it's not even based on, you know, where it's based on efficiency or something more meaningful. Because right. I don't care if it's got a tiny battery, if it can go 200 miles and people right. want to yeah. buy it. Okay. Uh, but, and, and also I think it would be ridiculous for something with a 200 plus kilowatt hour battery to get uh, some kind of green incentive when it's really barely green. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, there, there, there you go. So see, I, I'm going to start throwing you my theories because you agreed with me as opposed to Larry, who commonly doesn't. Well, that's because Larry's <laughs> smarter than you and me. <laughs> I love Larry. He's, yeah, yeah. he's, uh, a no nonsense firecracker. He is great. All right. So, all right. So what we've learned is that maybe, and this is, you know, this is not insignificant. I mean, nobody's talking about this. this is, I'm pretty sure we're the first channel to talk about the implications, the broad implications of the three, uh, 30 second uh, throughput number, because what we're talking about is pretty dramatic increases in potential capacity out of existing factories um, as we ramp up these new vehicles, uh, we can ramp them up potentially in existing buildings um, without having to build anything new. Sounds right to me. All right. Well, Brian, thanks so much for coming on and confirming ideas that were rumbling around in my brain over the last couple of days, finding pockets of empty space that they could light in <laughs> yes yes oh, mm -hmm. or something like that <laughs> thanks for being on and to all of you out there it's been great talking to you